Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, also known as TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Serena Phillips, a tobacco researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, C. Shang from Ohio State University, and Catherine McLean from Temple University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our spring 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Raj Nabat entitled The Impact of Tobacco-Free School Laws on Student and Staff Smoking Behavior. Rachna Bhatt is the Executive Director of Research and Policy Analysis for the University System of Georgia. She's involved in the collection and reporting of data on the students, faculty, and staff at the 26 public higher education institutions in the state. Her research evaluates education practices and programs in K through 16 settings with the goal of translating data into usable information for informed decision making and guiding policy. Previously, Rachna uh, worked as an assistant professor at Georgia State University. She earned a doctorate in economics at the University of Rochester and BS at The Ohio State University. Our discussant today is Dr. Julia Bennett, a postdoctoral associate at the Yale School of Public Health and Dr. Bott's co-author, Dr. Peter Henricks uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland will be available to answer questions in the Q&A. Dr. Bott, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you, Justin and Serena, for the nice introduction. Um, can I get a confirmation that you all can see my slides? Yes. OK, great. Um, so thank you to the organizers for having me today and for everyone for joining. I'm going to present on some research that's co-authored with Peter Heinrichs. In it, we examine the effect of statewide smoking bans at school which restrict everyone from smoking anywhere on school grounds at all times. We study how these bans impact the smoking behavior of students and school staff. Here's the disclosure side. So we were motivated to start this research because as you all know, there are many negative consequences associated with smoking. Some of the most devastating health outcomes are heart disease, cancer, impaired brain development, and low birth weight. There are monetary costs of treating these diseases as well as loss of life, making tobacco use the leading cause of preventable diseases and death. The data indicates that tobacco use often starts during youthhood. Every day, there are underage teens who try cigarettes for the first time, and some subsets of these teens become addicted and then turn into regular smokers. An estimated two-thirds of adult smokers report becoming daily smokers before they reach the age of 19. Schools are a common setting where policy is used to influence and encourage healthy behavior. One intervention that may be used to combat smoking is to incorporate some anti-tobacco teaching or programming in the health or physical education curriculum. This could be preventative or aimed at helping current students that smoke to stop. Another policy that has been used in schools as well as workplaces, restaurants, and public spaces has been a ban on indoor smoking. In 1994, the federal government passed the Pro-Children Act, which restricts anyone from smoking indoors in school facilities that receive federal funds. This federal ban did not impose any restrictions on smoking in outdoor areas on school grounds, nor does it limit locations or times when someone can smoke outdoors, such as in parking lots or before school starts. 
Some states have taken it a step further by implementing what we call 24 seven tobacco free school laws. These bans restrict the use of tobacco products by students, staff, and any visitors everywhere on school grounds at any time for any reason. Up through 2019, there have been 30 states as well as the District of Columbia, which have enacted these bans statewide in K through 12 schools. The language of these laws varies a bit, but a typical example is like Arizona's, which I've copied on the slide. In addition to penalties, sorry, I'm gonna leave this up for a little bit so you can read this. In addition to penalties, some of the laws specify that signs should be on display uh, mentioning the ban. And some of the laws specifically define what tobacco use covers in addition to regular cigarettes, such as smokeless snuff, e-cigarettes, or vapes. Most of the states that adopted bans in later years specifically include information about e-cigarettes or vapes as they've become more popular. So this slide shows the states that have adopted these 24-7 bans and the uptake over the years. We'll use this variation in adoption across states and years to identify whether there's an impact of the bans on smoking behavior. So how are these bans supposed to work? They're going to mechanically limit people's opportunity to smoke, as well as any exposure to secondhand smoke. They're also designed to reduce seeing other smoke. In that way, these bans are in sync with any anti-tobacco messaging that may be in the curriculum, and they model healthy behavior by example. The bans can also have an impact through peer or role model effects if that is a factor in a student's decision to smoke. A priori, there are a few reasons that we might not find that the bans are effective. First is the perceived penalty or likelihood of getting caught is just not enough to be a deterrent. Second is while that it could limit tobacco use at school, it might just displace it to other locations or times of the day. So there's been some prior research on smoking bans, uh, quite a large research actually, and um, they have examined the bans in a variety of settings. Research on bans in workplaces, bars and restaurants, and public spaces generally finds that they reduce direct tobacco consumption or secondhand smoke during the affected times or locations. However, additional research finds that these public space bans can lead to smoking to be displaced to other locations, like someone's home or car, so it can increase exposure to secondhand smoke in a different way. There are two papers which have looked at smoking bans in schools. The first by Bittler and co-authors uses a rating system that measures the restrictiveness of state smoking laws in various venues, including schools. They find that more, restricting smoking, more restrictive smoking laws are not associated with lower tobacco use among school staff. A more recent study that came out in 2020 examined smoking bans at schools in Germany and finds a sizable impact on reducing tobacco use among students and even household members of those who are exposed to the bans at school. So our research questions for the study is to look at how these specific 24 seven bans impact smoking behavior. The data allows us to look at both student and school staff tobacco use, and we observe whether and how much smoke someone smokes. Additionally, for some years in our data, we have responses about student smoking behavior while at school. As an extension of our main analysis, we run models testing whether the bans have differential effects depending on how long they have been in place. We also examine whether there are heterogeneous impacts on school staff who teach versus those who don't. The former are arguably more constrained and tied to the classroom during the day which would reduce their opportunities to smoke in general. Um, so I just wanted to pause and see if there are any questions before I continue on. Yeah, thank you. So maybe I will first see if our discussant, Julia Dennett, has any questions that she, at, at this stage. Hi, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, discuss this paper and uh, read it. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, I think it's very interesting and it definitely focuses on an understudied um, but important policy change. Um, 
I wanted to ask um, uh, as a first question, um, have you considered looking or as uh, during your research, did you look at the 1994 um, effect of the, na the national policy um, looking uh, that banned smoking uh, with the in indoors as well? Um, is that something you considered doing? Um, it is something that we factored into our analysis when looking at um, the years of data that we would use. So both of our data surveys have some years prior to 1994 that could be utilized, um, but we thought it best to restrict our samples to after 1994 so that we could have um, sort of comparable indoor um, smoking laws in place in these states um, and just sort of remove that from um, being a potential impact. I think it would be really interesting to see um, data before and look at see how indoor smoking bans um, had impacted student behavior and staff behavior. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to follow that up um, with the question. Uh, I was wondering if there was um, at the time period, if there's any kind of media reports or um, just in general, uh, any any kind of um, discussion of how people on the ground felt about these uh, bans as they were coming into place? Were people complaining about them or were they, uh, were people generally okay? I, I, I guess I'm uh, wondering if there's any information on kind of the, uh, the re just the reaction um, of affected parties um, to these laws. Yeah, that, that's interesting and not something that um, I have seen um, other than just some casual looking and, and Googling. Um, I think we could check on that and see what, what there was, see how much um, sort of fanfare or uh, potential controversy um, there might have been. Yeah, good suggestion. Thank you. Um, and I also, this might be a, a question better reserved uh, or just a, a thought reserved for later, but I was wondering, um, uh, uh, I was wondering if you uh, considered looking at any um, non-smoking outcomes, like I, I'm not sure what survey data is available for youth, but um, something like, oh, what, what, what uh, did the, did the smoking bans alter youth per, uh, attitudes, to, attitudes towards smoking or um, youth's perception of like, of like adult smoking in their lives or something along those lines? Um, I'm not sure what survey data is available, but just something that seemed kind of like an inter potentially interesting possibility. Yeah, yeah, I think um, seeing if, if the needle moved in terms of perception, um, outlook on things, I think that would be very interesting. I'll talk about a little bit later, um, we used some other survey sources that had some questions about um, viewing other smoke on campus, even when you know it's not um, allowed, uh, I, I, I think there are some surveys that might be more oriented towards like feelings about smoking and um, in particular, the teenage attitudes and practices study. Um, the data is kind of old for that, but they ask a lot of questions like, you know, do you smoke because you think it makes, makes you look cool? You know, all these sorts of things that I think we could look at as just sort of internal behavioral stuff that you don't have a lot of like tons of like quantitative data on. Yeah, great idea. Great, thank you. So it, uh, it's my impression that I think um, the YRBSS that you uh, data set that you use might have some, uh, a little bit of data on beliefs and attitudes as well. So that might be another place you could look. Um, yeah. There's one audience or actually now two coming in audience questions. Uh, one having to do with the literature regarding whether any of the studies have looked at um, uh, the effect to which these uh, bans have had on uh, substitution to other uh, other types of uh, other substances or, or behaviors. Other tobacco substances or like? Um, including, I, I think uh, also marijuana or other types of um, uh, substances as well. Um, I, yeah, I don't know that I remember seeing that in the literature. Um, okay. I can, I, yeah, I can, I can look through again um, uh, yeah. on some of the stuff that we mentioned, but I don't believe I have seen that. And, you know, in part, it might be because some of these 
studies that have been done on the smoking bans, I think have really utilized some unique data sets associated specifically with um, tobacco use. And so might not have some of the other stuff, but I think that would be, I think, um, yeah, I would I'd double check on that before I. Okay. And another related question is whether these bans tend to apply to marijuana as well, um, where it's legalized at least, do you, do you happen to know? I would have to review the ban language um, in a place yeah. like, I guess, like Washington State. Um, my guess is that because marijuana is restricted to 21 and over, that that's not going, it, you know, maybe it's, perhaps it's included, but it's not completely meant for this population or targeted right. towards this population. But yeah. Okay. Well, um, you're welcome to continue with the talk. Um, I, I think we've okay. heard the questions from the audience. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to jump into the data we use for our analysis. So to construct which states enacted a 24-7 ban and what year, we searched LexisNexis state legislative documents and supplemented from some other sources like the Center for Disease Control state system and the American Lung Associates Association State Legislative Action on Tobacco Issues. One thing that um, I want to note is that there are a few states which have laws that are looser than the 24-7 bans in that they allow for some sort of exceptions on um, smoking to, on school grounds. So might say, okay, smoking in evening hours when there's an event might be okay. So for our, our main analysis, we don't classify those as 24 seven bans, but we do an alternative specification where we treat those as bans and the results don't change in a meaningful way. The other state level covariates that we use in our models are statewide smoking bans in non-school settings like restaurants, bars, non-hospitality workplaces, the yearly cigarette tax in the state, and some economic measures like median household income and the unemployment rate. The student level data that we utilize comes from the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System or YRBSS. This is a cross-sectional survey of high school students from 1995 to 2019 that we utilize. We know the state that the students live in from using the restricted use version of the data and students are given the survey in school around the spring of every odd year. They are asked to report whether they've ever smoked a cigarette, number of days in the past month that they've smoked, and for some years of the survey, number of days in the past month that they've smoked at school. Since we don't know the exact month that the survey was conducted, we consider a student as exposed or treated by the 24-7 ban if a ban existed in their state at the beginning of the survey year. And I'll talk about some alternative specifications we do um, to see how uh, that changes our results. Another source that we utilize for both youth and then adult data is the tobacco use supplement of the current population survey. The supplement is administered every few years and survey respondents are asked if they've smoked more than 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. And if yes, then they are asked, are they current daily smokers? If yes to that, then they're asked how much they've smoked in the past month. So we construct a few samples from this data. The first consists of 15 year olds who are enrolled in high school. And the second is composed of adults age 22 through 65 that work in the elementary and secondary education industry. We're further able to break that population into those who list teaching as their primary occupation and those who do not. So as I mentioned um, in response to one of the questions, both the YRBSS and CPS data surveys go back prior to, 20, or to 1995, um, but we only use 95 onward because we thought it best for all states to have that indoor smoking ban in place for comparability, which happened after the federal legislation in 94. 
So this table shows the descriptive statistics for our YRBSS sample. The first few rows show the outcomes we've constructed based on survey responses. Half the sample has report, reported that they smoked a cigarette, they ever smoked a cigarette. 21% reported smoking in the past month and 16% more than three days in the past month. When it comes to smoking at school, 9% of students said that they smoked at school and 6% smoked more than three days at school. The sample size of our YRBSS is about 180,000 students. And uh, other than the other covariates which are there, I wanted to point out the um, state level school smoking ban. So that 35% represents 35% um, of our YRBSS population was exposed to a ban. So this table shows the descriptive statistics behind the tobacco use supplement samples of youth, teachers, and non-teachers in the education industry. Um, for ease of viewing, I just cut out all the demographic covariates, but if you wanna see uh, what those are, you can look at the paper. So you can see a similar percent of adults in this current population survey are exposed to the 24 seven ban as youth were in the YRBSS. So around 36% were exposed. But exposure among youth in the CPS is actually lower at 27%. So the reason for this is that around 2007, the current population survey stopped asking 15 to 17 year olds these questions about smoking. And so this CPS youth sample is really just more heavily slanted towards earlier years where um, fewer bans were in place. Another difference we see between the CPS and YRBSS is the prevalence of teen smoking. So 21% of teens in the YRBSS reported smoking in the past month, where it's five, whereas it's 5% in the CPS youth population. This difference may be a function of the tobacco use supplements um, survey structure. So their folks are only asked if they or are first asked if they've smoked more than 100 cigarettes. And it could be that these teens have smoked, but just not hit 100 yet. For anyone that says no to smoking more than 100, they're not asked any of the follow up questions. And so in order to construct their smoking outcomes, we set all their values to zero. Additionally, and this is speculative, but the YRBSS is done at school where the student may feel some level of privacy compared to a household interview for the CPS where a parent could possibly be present. So as I mentioned earlier, we use the variation in adoption of the 24 seven bands across states and years. We implement this as a difference in difference model where we regress the outcomes of interest for person I in state S and year T on a zero one indicator reflecting whether there was a 24 seven ban. The model in includes individual controls shown in the previous tables like gender and race, the state level covariates like cigarette taxes, a set of year fixed effects, state fixed effects, and state specific linear time trends. The identifying assumption of any difference in difference model is that in absence of treatment and conditional on the covariates, treated and control units would follow a common trend in their behavior, or in this case, smoking behavior. So in that way, our coefficient on the ban indicator would show the effect of the law and not another confounding factor. There are no direct ways to test this assumption. So we use some indirect checks that are common in the difference in differences literature. The first one is that we regress the 24 seven ban indicator on the individual and state level covariates and evaluate whether there are significant coefficients outside what we expect by probability. Resoundingly, we find little evidence of a correlation between these individual and state covariates and the ban indicator. Additionally, we replace the ban indicator in that difference in difference model with a series of dummies representing the years leading up to and after a state enacted the ban. This lets us evaluate trends in smoking behavior across treated and controlled 
prior to when the bands were adopted. We will also use this, examine, this model to examine if the bands had a different effect one year after they were implemented versus three years versus five years. Um, so I do want to stop again before I move on to the results, see if there's any questions. Yeah, great. Um, Julia, any, any questions? Yeah, um, uh, I was wondering, um, so I have one question about um, the empirical strategy uh, specifically. Um, so uh, you've included state-specific linear time trends. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you um, also considered running the regressions without those and reporting the results um, under the idea that uh, including them may actually be absorbing some of the long-term uh, changes that you, mm -hmm. that you could potentially see. Um, so you may be actually over, it, it could possibly be uh, kind of absorbing some of your effects, over controlling um, for possible effects. So I was wondering if you, if you happen to run those or if um, you uh, uh, had considered running them. Um, yes, I believe we did run them and the results did not change. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you're able to confirm that. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, so d I, I'm not as fully up to date on the new difference and difference literature. Um, so the cost of not including those um, state specific linear time trends and potentially sort of picking up other changes that have occurred for states over time. Is there some sort of um, balance or some uh, tests or anything like that that are out there that can be used to diagnose whether or not that's um, not, not maybe somebody in the comments has a suggestion, not that I know of. Um, I, I think reporting both, I think the, I, I read an excellent uh, literature review um, which suggested reporting both, but um, I'm not sure if there's a consensus beyond that, but yeah, thank yeah, you. That's definitely a good idea. Yeah. Um, okay, so any chat questions? So, uh, so uh, no, I, I would maybe throw out one other question though. Um, so it looks like in your data, you can't identify be below the state level, but I was curious whether um, there are any local regulations that might've uh, existed on that, like local school bans. And it seems like to the extent that those would exist, they might lead you to perhaps uh, bias you towards zero, I would think. Uh, and one thing you could do if you are able to measure those would be to, you know, look at the fraction of uh, uh, students within a state that are treated, for example, uh, as a continuous measure instead of a uh, dummy variable for yes, no. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that I, I'm, I'm not actually sure, but like a data source like uh, NREF, uh, Americans um, for Non-Smokers Rights Foundation might have data on that perhaps. And I don't know, I don't know if it's something you've thought about. Um, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, we do sh use um, the School Health Practices and Policy Survey, um, which goes out to school administrators, and I'll show. I'll talk about the data in a little bit um, to look at whether or not schools have sort of smoking restrictions in place, and they do. Um, so that happens in situations where the school is in a state that has a ban. And then it also happens in situations where the state doesn't have a ban. Um, so I definitely think that that is um, so a factor for sure in terms of contributing to um, sort of not seeing much results, which sorry to, to blow the surprise. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, there, there's one other uh, comment in the Q&A, which is to that effect that, you know, there might be these, these voluntary um, bans that schools are implementing even, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's a, a great tie-in. Uh, feel free to uh, continue then. Okay, thanks. All right, so this table shows the first set of results using the YRBSS data. So we just display the coefficients on the ban for ease of viewing, um, but all the covariates I previously mentioned are included. Um, and so looking across the six different outcomes, five different outcomes, 
Um, we find no significant effects of the bans on whether a student reports smoking, nor on the intensity of smoking within the past month. We do find a small but only marginally significant impact on ever smoking at school. This table shows the results using the CPS, where our sample consists of high school students between 15 and 18. And here we find some significant point estimates suggesting the ban is associated with approximately a 1.5 percentage point decrease in the likelihood of smoking, more than 100 cigarettes in a student's lifetime and in the past month. Um, but given the sort of disconnect between the YRBSS and CPS data, um, we you know, tried to think about some potential reasons and really they kind of devolved back to the fact that the surveys are asked in a very, the questions about smoking are asked in a very different way. Um, and um, there might be some other environmental factors associated with the survey. If anybody in the audience has any thoughts about, um, you know, seeing different kind of conclusions, um, although these are small, um, I would love to hear it. So here are the results um, when we look at school staff and how the ban impacts their smoking behavior. So the top half of the table is for teachers and the bottom half is for non-teachers. Across almost every outcome, we estimate small and insignificant effects. The only one that is marginally significant is smoking at least a pack per day and that's among teachers. So as I mentioned, we estimate some diff and diff models where we replace the single dummy variable indicating a ban with a series of dummies for the years leading up to and after the ban. This slide shows the coefficients on those dummies when we look at the outcome of ever smoking in the left-hand side and smoked in the past month on the right-hand side. Looking at the first at the co um, and sorry, let me mention that the omitted category is the year that the ban was enacted. So looking first at the coefficients on the years before the ban, we find a bit of evidence of pre-existing trends. Specifically in the second panel, the estimates for six and five years before the ban are statistically significant. This seems to suggest that the states which enacted the bans may have had higher but declining rates of smoking relative to those who did not, which puts the identifying assumption into question. Looking at the years after the ban is in place, and again, reminder with the YRBSS data, we didn't find any significant effects. Um, we see that there's no um, significant estimates popping up when we separate out the years, suggesting that the ban is minimal, sort of no longer, uh, no matter how long it's been in effect. The dynamics for the CPS youth population are shown in this slide. So in these two panels, the years before the ban are all insignificant. So that's a little bit of a difference from the one finding with the YRBSS. Um, and we find the largest impact of the ban to be one year after it's in place. Um, although the remaining years still show some sort of smaller but um, significant impacts. I think um, the suggestion of looking into media uh, reports or um, some other uh, news items might be helpful in sort of su supporting that, that um, perhaps like the biggest impact happened right when it when these bans were enacted because there was the most publicity around it um, or most hype. Um, and then maybe it became sort of commonplace. Oops. So I wanted to um, tell you about some extensions of our model. So in the paper, we show a series of difference and difference models where we use alternative definitions of the ban to see how our results change. Across all these specifications, we find no meaningful difference in the results. 
The alternatives that we use are to classify something as a ban only if it does not have any exceptions for demonstrations or prescription use of tobacco. So some states might allow um, tobacco to be smoked in a health class, maybe to show the uh, negative impacts of it. Um, that seems like an extreme uh, example or an extreme um, sort of thing that you would require students to do. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think that that's, that's a very large um, thing. The other one is that we also considered things that were banned um, if they were enacted at the state level. So in some of the legislative um, documents, we saw references to the states requiring the districts to enact a ban as opposed to the state enacting the ban. And then we also only considered things bans if they were enacted by the legislature as opposed to some other statewide administrative body. But across all these different definitions of bans, we still find um, similar results. We also uh, run models in the YRBSS data where we modify the ban indicator to equal one if the ban is in place between January and June of a given survey year as opposed to just January or just the beginning of the year. And then we also broaden our definition of what a ban is and we consider something a ban even if it allows for those um, uh, minimal hours exceptions. Um, and again, the results don't change. So overall, our results indicate that there's little to no impact of the bans on youth smoking. Only the results from CPS youth are statistically significant and we also find no effect on school staff. So as I mentioned earlier, there can be several explanations for way, why we may not observe an impact of the bans. One factor could be that students and staff just ignore the laws and so that they're not effective. Additionally, there could be a lack of enforcement or implementation by, of the bans at specific schools. And then as was mentioned earlier, it could be that schools or districts have their own bans, which might render any statewide bans redundant, or even if a state doesn't have a ban, the local school district or local school might. So we turn to some other data sources to gauge what evidence there is for these sort of explanations or factors. So we can assess student compliance with the smoking restrictions, with smoking restrictions um, using the Teenage Attitudes and Practices Survey. So in this survey, less than 10% of high school students report that their peers are always complying with school smoking restrictions. That says there's a, a good amount of um, rejection of or disobeying of these uh, restrictions on schools. Additionally, in the National Youth Tobacco Survey, 37% of teens report that they know someone who used tobacco in school, on school property in the past month. It's not just teens that report seeing fellow students and staff violate smoking restrictions. Responses from school administrators in the School Health Practices and Policy Survey indicates that there's a substantial proportion of schools where students are caught disregarding smoking restrictions. So this table shows the percent of schools that responded yes, that a student, there was a student who violated any smoking restriction um, at school. That SHPPS survey also provides some evidence on the implementation of statewide bans and the prevalence of local level restrictions. So school administrators are asked whether there are bans on smoking on school grounds for specific people and times. This survey um, is conducted about every six years. And so what we have in the table is the survey data from 94, 2000, 2006, and 2014. And what we've done is we've broken up the school responses into those um, schools that are in states that have bans and schools that don't, or states that don't have bans. And we do not have any um, state identifiers for the 1994 data. And so that's why we're uh, not able to do that. So there are a few takeaways from this table. So first, looking back at 1994, when there were already a very few uh, states that had the 24-7 ban, more than 90% of surveyed schools 
had some sort of school restriction on smoking on school grounds for students. And about 60 to 70% had some sort of school smoking restriction for staff. So this indicates that even if a state lacks a ban, a school might. Second, in the years where we can split the data between banned and non-banned states, we find that less than 100% of the schools in states with a ban actually report that there is some sort of restriction on smoking on school grounds. So that suggests to us that maybe not every school is promoting or prioritizing the enforcement of these statewide smoking bans. And then finally, looking at that last column, we find a meaningful proportion of schools that have some ban in place, despite their state not mandating it. So overall, our results, along with these additional data sources, indicate that the statewide 24-7 bans do not have a meaningful, measurable, it measured impact on smoking behavior of students and staff. This may be related to a lack of enforcement, the penalty not being enough of a deterrent, or existing smoking restrictions at school um, sort of accomplishing the same intent, but not at the state level. Um, so with that, that is the end of my presentation. Happy to take any um, questions from the last slide, last set of slides or just overall. Great, thank you so much, that was great. Um, I will again turn to our discussant, Julia Dennett, to see if she wants to start us off with questions. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for this very careful um, analysis. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, so first, I just wanted to um, ask if uh, you could clarify what the consequences would be for um, what the consequences would be for not enforcing um, the uh, the bans uh, for the schools and then also potentially like how how they could, how schools could potentially enforce the bans within schools. Like, do they discipline the students, suspensions, things like that? Um, like, typically, how has that been uh, done in the past? Yeah, I think um, the, answering your last question first. Um, so, in that Arizona, Arizona example of the laws, you know, they just specify that there's a penalty, um, but they don't specify exactly what that is. In a few of the state legislative documents, we saw like monetary numbers, like $150 or things like that. Um, I'd have to go back through the uh, laws which we have in the appendix of our paper to see if any of them discuss um, suspension for students. Since these laws apply to sort of not just students, but like school staff and visitors, I think um, the monetary seems to be more all purpose. Uh, can't really suspend parents, I guess. <laughs> um, and then in terms of penalties that schools might incur for not enforcing um, statewide law, I don't know that I have a good answer to that. I think we could check to see if there's something in the legislative documents which specify um, how, how that would go, um, whether or not you know, that that's something that gets checked on yearly audits or um, is something that like a school resource officer at a central office has to confer is ha confirm is happening at every school. But yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'm looking at that. Um, and uh, another question I had um, as I was looking at your uh, sample population, um, it's uh, focusing on high schoolers is uh, super interesting. I was also wondering um, though that uh, it, it seems elementary school students would have also been affected by this and clearly um, most elementary school students wouldn't have access to tobacco in any form hopefully but um, they could potentially be exposed to maybe cultural change like like changing cultural or social social norms at the school um, uh, those sorts of things. So I was just wondering if you considered looking at this from a longer term perspective, uh, for example, seeing if uh, elementary school students who are exposed to these bans, uh, uh, if that has an effect on later smoking initiation rates once they're 17, 18 years old. Yeah, yeah, I think that that could be interesting. 
yeah, I think there's a couple, I guess, of ways to operationalize that if you're thinking about looking at people when they're older and seeing what was in place when they were in, in, in their youth. Um, also, the YRBSS does have a middle school um, survey. The one we used is the high school survey. So I think we could look at the middle school survey and if they ask questions about smoking, sort of see what the, the prevalence of it is. I know we think that, you know, if you're under 14, you probably don't have great access to back to, to cigarettes on a regular basis, but, um, you know, there's all sorts of exceptions. Yeah, yeah, but that would be good. I think the, um, paper I mentioned about the German school bands, that that does something like what you're saying, um, where it, it, it takes people from, it's not the general survey, but some, some pretty common German um, data set, and it ties back like, yeah, what were the bands when they were youth? Excellent, thank you. Um, and uh, finally, I was just wondering um, if you could comment on um, uh, what, the policy implications might be uh, for this paper or just or avenues for future res research that um, uh, questions this paper raises about what other what researchers should be looking into who are interested in this question. Um, I think I, you know, from some of the questions from what Justin mentioned, you know, looking at sort of substitution effects and seeing if um, there's an impact on sort of other uh, actions or behaviors such as marijuana use, um, you know, maybe even drinking, um, potentially, if those are sort of complementary activities, I think that would be um, some interesting future research. I think what you mentioned about middle school and seeing, looking at impact um, at that age level. I think in terms of the policy implications of, of the results. Um, you know, this is a statewide sort of effort, whereas we're seeing some reasonable evidence that a lot of stuff is already happening at the local level. And so perhaps um, thinking about if a statewide legislation exists, how best to put that into practice to make sure that what's happening at the school level coincides with that or to make sure that the policies that ex already exist at the school level are complementary. Um, so I think I think that I, I think it also can't hurt <laughs> to have sort of a statewide ban if there's a school level one already. Um, perhaps there's there's some redundancy of that in that but um, I work in state government and so there's there's no lack of uh there's no cap on laws or legislation <laughs> so um yeah all, all good questions and all good um sort of things to consider thank you so much thank you. great so uh your co-author uh peter has been very proficient at uh clearing out questions there's maybe one remaining having to do with uh, whether or not you looked at second and third hand smoking and how that might change uh, in response to the bans uh, and, and if that's something you've thought about. Um, second hand smoke, yeah, I guess um, thinking about what kind of data would, could answer that question. I think there would have to be some, something related to like, how many instances are you in a, how many times are you in a situation where your others around you are smoking? Um, like, did, did you uh, smell their smoke? You know, those sorts of things. Um, third hand smoke, I'm not familiar with. I don't know what that means. Is that? Uh, uh, so, so that means, means, uh, uh, sorry, there's a, uh, somebody else talking. Um, so I, I think that refers to like uh, smoke, smoke that gets that on gets furniture, on. for example, or, or Got that it. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'd have to explore um, what kind of data sets exist to, to be able to tease that information out. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think uh, those are all, all the questions that we have at this point. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this was a really informative presentation. Thank you.
Um, and thank you, Peter, for answering questions on the chat. Um, I really appreciated everybody's um, input and the great um, comments from the discussant, uh, Julia and Justin and Michael and everybody who's participated today. Thanks. Serena, we'll, we'll be taking us out. So. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 160 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.